Welcome everyone. My name is Marquesa Pedway and I'm a business reinvention expert here in New York City and I'm also a columnist for Speaker Magazine and this is part of a special feature that I'm doing called the Celebrity Speaking Path and who else would know better than celebrity speakers and today I have a special guest for you. Everyone knows who he is so let me let me just take you to his official bio. Dr. George C. Frazier is chairman and CEO of FrazierNet Incorporated, a 29-year-old global networking movement with a mission to increase opportunities for people of African descent. Author of five best-selling books, he produces the award-winning Power Networking Conference. Uh, Forbes magazine named it one of the top five conferences not to be missed in America. It just happened in D.C., and I believe George said this was number 15. Anybody who's anybody is there. Uh, Upscale Magazine named him one of the top 50 power brokers in Black America, and Black Enterprise Magazine called him Black America's number one networker and featured him on its cover. Five of Dr. Frazier's speeches have been selected for reprint and worldwide distribution by the prestigious publication. Uh, Vital Speeches of the Day, a first for any professional speaker in America, regardless of color. Now, he's also been featured on seven national magazine covers and has received 350 awards and citations to include induction into the Minority Business Hall of Fame and Museum, three honorary doctorate degrees, and an ambassadorship. Guys, his bio is so amazing. You've got to check it out. But welcome, Mr. George Frazier. So excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marquette. I, I appreciate it. And thank you for the work that uh, Marquesa, right? Marquesa. Yes. Let me get that pronunciation right. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, thank you for being a drum in our community. Thank you for the great work that you're doing both writing and speaking and uh, you are a gem and you are, um, you know, you, you're just a compliment to um, the human race and, and specifically our race. And I deeply appreciate the work that you're doing and thank you for thinking of me. And having me on. <laughs> well, thank you. And you know what, Dr. Frazier, it was easy to think of you. Uh, when I started to put together this, your name came up several times and not by coincidence. Let's start with how is it, how did you build such a reputation and such a name in the world of professional speaking? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, patience, discipline, discipline. And discipline has four cornerstones. First, you have to have a vision. I always wanted to speak. I didn't know that I could speak, but I had a desire. I always admired people who uh, use the pulpit or use the, um, use the podium. So I had a vision. Uh, and then I had a little plan. Uh, and then I had the patience, uh, the patience to, you know, sort of do my plan. And, uh, and then, you know, execution. So those are the four cornerstones of discipline. And so I had the discipline and really the patience to just do it inch by inch. It's a cinch by the yard. It's hard. Um, and I'm an incrementalist by nature, and I just love uh, taking on tasks. This is going to sound strange, that take time, that take um, uh, cultivating, that is really like a big lump of clay that you have to turn into something. I love those kinds of challenges. And of course, um, developing a speaking career absolutely requires that. So um, that's, you know, it's, it's no more complicated than that. I don't think we ought to make it complicated. Uh, you know, the greatest fear the human has is the fear of speaking. Uh, it's greater than the fear of dying. Um, so the number one fear is the fear of speaking. The number two fear is, is the fear of dying. And the number three fear is the fear of speaking and dying in front of an audience. So uh, getting over that uh, and applying the discipline necessary to get over that is critically important. And somehow or another, organically, Mark, I said, I, uh, uh, I understood that and acted on that. Wow. And it still shocks me that dying or speaking is before dying. Really? Yeah. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> now you mentioned the word discipline. Um, I find that a lot of speakers, especially new ones and aspiring speakers, will say, "Oh, but people love me, and they're changed by me, and my speech is wonderful." But they forget the business side of it. Can you share a little bit about what does that mean to you, and what have you taught? other speakers, not to mention practice yourself in your own life to make speaking a true business, which sometimes is a disconnect for newer speakers? Yeah, that's a great question. What I've taught other speakers is, first of all, you have to be about what you're speaking about. Um, when Elon Musk gets up to speak about entrepreneurship, people are leaning forward. They're all ears because he is about what he speaks about, the same thing with Bob Johnson. Um, and so you have to be about what you're speaking about because people are asking a question in their own mind when they see you up there pontificating ad nauseum. They're asking, they won't ask you this question, but they're asking themselves this question, and that is, are you doing what you're talking about? Are you a model of the behavior or of the insight or of the inspiration or the empowering conversation. Are you a model of that yourself? So be about what you speak about. Understand that the purpose of great speaking, from my perspective, is to educate, to inspire, and to empower people in an entertaining way. Great speaking is a performance. And, and you you have, it. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And you, and you have to use the palette of the speaker as the artist uses the palette to paint his or her masterpiece. What are the palette? What are the things that are in the palette? Well, they're words, obviously. You have to understand the power and importance of syntax, uh, how you put words together. When you say words, right timing for those words, tone, motion, expression, gesture, humans, ideas, you know, I should say not humans, but humor. Humor is a very, very powerful way to teach lessons. Of course, communicating effectively ideas, using props, using PowerPoints. These are all tools that are part of the palette of the speaker and the speaker that uses those tools the best in the right combination with the right audience at the right time is the speaker that leaves an impact. You know, at the Power Networking Conference, we have a thing called Power Talks. Power Talks. Big ideas that matter. And you only get 17 minutes, 17 minutes to blow it out of the water. That's all you really need. And you have all of the tools for the palate of the speaker. And some really excel, and you've seen it in TED Talks. So ours is sort of the black version of TED Talks. Um, but so, so using effectively the palette of the speaker is what I emphasize, because I get lots of questions when I get up there. People say, well, how do you do that? You don't look like you're reading. It's just practice, 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 practice. Start small. Right. Start with your church group, with your Boy Scout pack, you know, join Toastmasters, join the national speakers. Start small. Do not get on a big stage. Right. And you don't have the experience to handle or the body of knowledge when I say experience to draw from, to perform and to entertain and to educate, inspire, and empower people. So you've got to practice, practice, practice. In fact, for two years, I didn't charge a dime for speaking. I was just glad anybody who would have me, anybody, any two people who would gather to hear me say anything, right? I was, I was happy with that because I was really practicing. And so practice, 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 write your first, I wrote my first speech. I didn't read it. You can't stand up there and read a speech, but I wrote it. So to give me some way to uh, some, some map, you know, so there's a beginning, a middle and an end. And then I stood in front of a mirror and I practiced it. And my first speech was only about 10 minutes long. So that's the advice. And, and, and so if you do that, if you, you know, I, I, I sign only, 
three words when I sign books, and I've signed thousands and thousands of books. Over the three words are stay the course. Stay the course. Now, here's what that means. It means chart a good and righteous course. In other words, everything that is good is not right for you, right? Chart a good and righteous course. Stay that course. Then all that is due you will come to you, right? So speaking is an anointment. You heard me say this at the top of the program. It's an anointment, right? Because the greatest fear we have is the fear of speaking greater than the fear of dying. So if, in fact, you want to be on the stage or you want to speak or you want to sing or you want to perform or you want to entertain, that's an anointment, right? Most people don't want to do that. They'd rather die than get up in front of a bunch of people and be judged because that's what's happening when you're speaking, right? All eyes are on you. You can hear a pin drop, right? And your words and your gestures and your uh, how you comport yourself and how you present yourself, uh, you are setting yourself up for criticism and judgment. Most people can't handle that. Uh, you know, you need somewhat of a pretty stable ego to, to, to handle that because you will be judged. People will say, I, you know, you fulfilled uh, a dream that I had or you disempowered my life. Um, so Speaking is no joke, but if, in fact, you feel compelled to do it, it means that God has anointed you to do it. You're one of the few. That now means that you're not automatically going to get out there and be the world's greatest speaker. You're going to do what Les Brown has done, what Lisa Nichols and I have done, what, what all the great speakers have done. You're going to have to start small. You're going to have to practice, practice, practice. You're going to have to fail. You're going to have to stumble. You may even have to pass out. I, mean, I wrote a, a story in a, a book uh, I recently completed with Les Brown, uh, Mission Unstoppable, Extraordinary Stories of Failure's Blessings, right? So what was my story? My story was one of the first big speaking engagements I had when I was in corporate America with Procter & Gamble. I had never really had a, a platform quite that big with people that important. In my first speaking engagement with Procter & Gamble, which was a very sophisticated sort of presentation for a product that we wanted a big supermarket to take, I passed out at the podium, right? <laughs> they had to walk me off the stage, right? So this can happen, right? Now, here I am considered one of the great speakers in America, but in my first few stages and passages of learning how to speak, I actually passed out, right? I passed out on my feet. So um, uh, it's okay, uh, but you, 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 know, you have to get over that fear, uh, um, and you will just do it. Just do it. Just do it. What Nike tells us that just do it, right? Just get out there and do it. Because if you're feeling you want to do it, but you're fearful of doing it, the only way you're going to get over that is to do it. It's like the fear of flying. They teach you this all the time in the fear of flying. They say, how do you get over the fear of flying? You have to fly. That's true. Right? You have to fly. So the same thing with speaking. If you, if you admire people who can speak, you're watching people and say, man, I'd love to be there up there someday, right? Then that means you're anointed to do that. Oh, I love this. Right? That means you have to go through the hills and valleys, the twists and turns, the, you know, of, of actually practicing and failing and stumbling and actually doing it. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a life-changing gift. You change people's lives. The power of words are unbelievable. I mean, really, words have power. So that's my advice to those who want to speak. And then rising to the point of celebrity mm -hmm. is a whole other thing. Now, so let's kind of dig into that. Um, usually, I'm thinking a lot of my colleagues that are ready to get into celebrity speaking, they've got that fear thing pretty much under control, although it still hits them a little bit. They're thinking, okay, what if I can do a TED Talk and become famous like Brene Brown? Or they're thinking, what if I can be as famous as Les Brown? Um, or even Lisa Nichols or yourself. So what would you say are some of the steps to become known which is really what celebrity is, what would be some of those steps or even strategies yeah. that you'd recommend? Um, I call it branding. I spent 13 years with Procter & Gamble in branding and marketing, so it's branding yourself. So first of all, what is it that you want to be known for? 
Um, Les Brown started very early as the motivator. So he wanted to be known as a motivational speaker. I wanted to be known as a subject matter expert that was inspirational. And, and my subject was networking. So in order for me, because I, I, I noticed that I was organically very good at it myself. I had a very high EQ. It wasn't called EQ at the time. It was called interpersonal and people skills. But I had a very high EQ. I got along and, and was able to work with and through other people uh, very easily. I was, was a, you know, a great team builder, a great leader. Um, and I noticed this, this sort of happened uh, naturally and very easily with me. And, uh, and then, you know, when I was young, there were books that were coming out that, you know, that white folks were writing called, about networking. Actually, there were 14 books written on networking before I wrote my seminal book on networking in, the, uh, in Black America called Success Runs in Our Race, the Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community. Well, there were already 14 books on the subject of networking, but not targeted to Black people. And so what I did is I wrote a book out of my own personal experience um, and the things that I did that, that enabled me not only to lead, but to rise quickly and to, uh, and to inspire and to organize uh, uh, large numbers of people to do extraordinary things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so the, my first step towards celebrity came when I met Earl Graves, the yeah. iconic businessman who started and, and still is chairman of the board of Black Enterprise and Black Enterprise Magazine. Um, I always wanted to meet Earl Graves. Uh, so this was probably 1983 or so. It was a desire to meet him. And I teach people all the time, if you want to meet important people, you have to be where important people are because they're not coming to you. You have to go to them, right? So a good friend of mine, uh, Carol Hoover here in Cleveland, was a good friend with Barbara Graves, um, the wife of Earl Graves. And she came to me, she knew I wanted to meet Earl Graves. And she said, listen, a Black Enterprise ma- magazine is doing a series of networking events, this is around 1983, and um, uh, a tour. Uh, and they're looking for local chairpersons. Would you like to chair uh, the Black Enterprise networking event in Cleveland, Ohio? I said, absolutely, count me in. I'll be more than happy. She says, it's going to be a lot of work. It's a volunteer. Uh, you still want to do it. And I said, absolutely. And so I took on that responsibility, worked for months, well, actually over a year on it, uh, produced the event for uh, Earl Graves. Of course, Earl rolls into town. We, 600 people show up. It was the best uh, networking event of the, his entire tour per capita. We had more people than anybody, including his own city in New York and Atlanta and some of the big urban centers. And so Earl was very, very happy and very complimentary. And um, uh, uh, he rolls into his uh, networking event in Cleveland, and he's with the governor of Ohio, uh, Dick Celeste. I would have never met the governor without Earl. Uh, he had on this beautiful tie. You know, Earl was a sharp dress. I said, Earl, that's a, that's a beautiful tie. He said, would you like it? I said, absolutely. He actually took the tie off and gave it to me. So w- what happened was I met Earl Graves by serving Earl Graves. I found something that Earl wanted and needed. And I raised my hand and I did it out of love and without condition. And then, and then performed with excellence because I knew Earl was all about excellence. Fast forward, um, it was eight years later. I remained in contact with Earl. I showed up at his events and wherever he was, I was, right? But I never bugged him. I never asked him for anything. I just was there. You need any help? What can I do? You need your shoes shine? Whatever, whatever, whatever you want, right? Eight years later, um, uh, William Morrow Morrow asked me to write a book on networking in Black America, Success Runs in Our Race. I wrote the book, sent the galley to Earl Graves and said, Mr. Graves, if you would do me a personal favor and just give me a little comment, maybe just, you know, thumb through it and see if you like it. He said, sure. Of course he would say, sure. I had cultivated, nurtured, and built a relationship, of course. This is the first thing I'd ever asked him for. 
So he said, sure, send it to me. I sent it to him. He read the book. He said, this is the best book on networking I've ever read. He said, not only will I give you a blurb, I'm going to put you on the cover of Black Enterprise magazine, and I'm going to excerpt your book. He said, we've never done a book excerpt in Black Enterprise magazine. We'd like to make this the first. And you know I love networking. You know I'm about networking. So you're going on the cover of Black Enterprise magazine, and the magazine will come out the day your book is published. And not only that, when your book is published, I want you to have the publishing party at our executive offices on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Yes. Right? This is, right? Now, all of this because I cultivated, nurtured, and built a relationship, served Earl Grays. I end up on the cover of Black Enterprise magazine, and that began my celebrity. Right? That was the first step. So, you want to become a celebrity, your speaker, write a book, even if you have to self publish it. You don't have to get a big publisher. I was lucky that was back in the day. Publishing has all changed. Write a book on your expertise. Get help. Get help on how it's to be packaged, how the cover's to be designed. Get people that know what they're doing, right? But write a book if you want to up-level your profile in the world of speaking. Because it's one thing for people to hire you uh, to speak. It's another thing when they see your resume that you are an author of some area of expertise. You are a published author. So that's the first step that one has to take if they want ultimately to become a celebrity speaker. That's what Simon Bailey has done. That's what Delatoro McNeil has done. Delatoro has even produced what? A television series. This brother is going to be and already is at some level of celebrity. Right, so you have to think outside the box, you have to do different things. Right, you have to separate yourself from the masses. That's number one. Number two, know your audience and pick your spots. Know your audience, um, yeah, know your audience and pick your spots. There's certain venues certain events in America and in black America uh, that are celebrity events. When you speak, for example, at the Congressional Black Caucus in September, when you speak at the NAACP, when you speak at the Urban League, when you speak at the Black Enterprise Conference, when you, there's certain selected conferences, certainly in our community, when you speak at certain mega churches, right, that live stream, um, uh, that increases your celebrity. Use social media. It's one of the most effective. Marketing, yes. It's one of the most effective, in a sense, free marketing tool, most powerful marketing tool uh, in the world. Other than, second only, really, I think, to television. Mm-hmm. Use social media. If you are a speaker, you're crazy not to have a LinkedIn page, a Facebook page, uh, an Instagram page, a, a, you know, a Twitter page. Um, use social media. And use social media to communicate your ideas in blurbs. I don't know if you've been on my Facebook page recently. You know that I have a whole new meme M-E-M-E strategy. Not only am I giving you daily quotes, but I am syncing and synchronizing my quotes to some photograph of myself that is a physical expression of that quote, Mm -hmm. right? So prior to changing to a meme strategy, I would just put my quote on the page and I would get very, very a nice response. But now that I've added a picture to it, Right, and you can do this all with the little app that you can download on your in your cell phone. Uh, my uh, likes have quadrupled, quadrupled. So there are a number of ways you can use social media to build your celebrity and to build um, your reputation uh, around a subject matter expertise, right? You cannot be all things to all people, 
right? You, no one's looking for you to motivate them around uh, string theory, right? What is it that you know? What is it that you love? If you look behind me, look behind me, you'll see a library. That's just my office library. There's a thousand books in that library. So the second thing, if you want to become a celebrity speaker, read. Be, you know, know a little bit about a lot of things so that you can be conversational. Not only uh, in person, one-on-one, -on -one, as you're talking to people who can potentially hire you, right? But conversational on the stage so that you can answer questions in a 360-degree way, right? So read. I read 100 books a year. Wow. The average American only reads one book a year. If you read one book a month, right, in five years you will have read 60 books and the average American will have only read five. Mm. harder right so read that adds not only to um your physical presentation but it adds to the roundness and the richness of your uh intellectual presentation all right and humor use humor if you want to be you want to be celebrity use humor humor is absolute sign of intelligence people who can right absolute sign of intelligence people who can laugh at themselves people who can laugh at things that happen to them in life uh this is very engaging and very endure, uh, endearing of an audience and it's a very very powerful way to get people to remember what you said and it puts you in the performance category of speaking right not just a great speech, that's important. I'm not minimi uh, minimizing the power of your ideas and your words. Very important. But how you perform them and how you deliver them, how you comport yourself on the stage, your, everything from, from not only your words and your hairdo uh, and your dress and your attire, Everything is people. You remember, you are standing on the stage by yourself. Mm -hmm. All eyes are on you, and people are looking at you from head to toe. That's right. Right? Head to toe. So, celebrity type speakers know how to keep the attention on them and not on their pink suit. Say right? it. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm talking about a brother wearing a pink suit. Now, that's different if you're singing or whatever. Right? Uh, if you're giving a serious speech, uh, no. There's a certain way you have to look. So no one is distracted by what you're wearing. They're, they're looking at you. They're focused on you. Celebrity type speakers understand the power of appearance. Right? And you know, this is so good. You've given us so many things. I mean, I, I think I wrote a whole book. <laughs> I took a lot of bullet points on what you've said so far. Uh, thank you for sharing that story about relationships and how you know you, you had that opportunity to connect with an influencer, uh, Dr. Earl Graves. And you know, you you leveraged that opportunity and you wrote something that you know a lot about, which is relationships and taking that to the next level. He was so impressed, it got you on the cover of Black Enterprise. And I think that sends a message to us that always be ready. You never know when that opportunity is gonna present itself. That's and at right. times you're not ready when the opportunity right. is there. But you were ready and that you've just blown up from there. People, because you're on the cover of Black Enterprise, people learn to trust you. You have your own powered networking conference. This was the 15th year it's happened. And how many people were in attendance at this conference uh, this year? It was sold out, about 1,500 people. Wow. Sold, sold out two months in advance. Two months in advance. No advertising, no promotion, all viral. Right? Just word of mouth, right? And that yeah. is relationships right there. I mean, that you are the relationship girl, which you said, pick that lane and own it and share it with everyone that's out there. That's amazing. Yes. Uh, there are speakers that are listening. I know that you have a lot of speakers that you highlight at your conference. Mm -hmm. Any tips for those that are listening that'll say, hey, I want to meet this guy and I want to get on the stage. 
any tips for them? Because you, you do this well. Not only are you a speaker in your own right, a celebrity in your own right, but you also put on a huge conference featuring a lot of speakers. So what would you like to share something about that a little bit? Yeah, I think that um, we, the faculty, we call our speakers and everyone that contributes information and knowledge and love to our conference that get on our big stage. This is a big stage, it's a big microphone, of, as you know, it was live streamed, thousands and thousands of people. In fact, more people are watching that are not there, right, than are there, and then we have a lot of people there. But it, it's very powerful to stand on a stage like that in front of a thousand people, right? That really energizes you. So we're constantly looking for brothers and sisters and others, uh, who have something to say, who have a good idea that matters. Um, but you have to be very practiced. You have to be a top pro. You have to, it, it, it's like TED Talks. I mean, you know, if you, if you watch TED Talks, only the best, only the best get that stage for 17 minutes. The same thing with Power Talks. So, um, uh, I, you know, I wanted to create this platform, and I just want to be very transparent here because I've been a watcher of TED Talks and an admirer of TED Talks for years and years and years. And I've learned so much from so many people on TED Talks and the few uh, black folk that have been on there, right, uh, have been just incredible. You know. So I've sat and watched that, and I said, you know, someday I am going to create a platform Form that powerful, that magnificent for African Americans, right? And um, and there will always be a sprinkling of others, and we did this year. We had a sprinkling of others, just like TED Talks always has a sprinkling of us. <laughs> we have a sprinkling of them. Right? <laughs> but I wanted something that big and magnificent and powerful and and uh, uh, for us, and now we have it. Not only that, but I think we have shifted the paradigm on what conferencing ought to look like and be like in the 21st century for African Americans. It's 15 years ago, we, we started by saying we want to we want to craft a conference uh, uh, by which all other conferences in Black America would be judged. Right? We arrived at that uh, three years ago when Forbes magazine named Power Networking one of the top five conferences not to be missed in America. Not one of the top five black conferences, one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed. And so we are always, just as TED Talks are looking for the best and brightest minds to, to bless this stage, we now want brothers and sisters when they see the video because we, you know, all of the talks were were obviously high definition, pre-recorded or recorded, right? There'll be a whole package. People will be able to see some of the best and brightest minds. We want brothers and sisters who who aspire to be speakers to have getting on our power talk stage as a goal. We, I mean, really, I I say that without ego. <laughs> that with humility just as for years getting uh, an invitation to TED Talks and I've had two uh, getting on our stage to talk with a power talk and to talk to our audience is a goal they aspire to do that and that they man up and woman up and do all the things necessary uh, to start and to build their speaking career reaching the point of semi-celebrity getting on the Power Talk stage, the Power Networking Conference stage, and that launching them into celebrity. Well, see, guys, there's an opportunity right there to raise your profile. One mm -hmm. thing I know about Dr. Frazier, uh, everyone knows who you are, and you just have a, a, just a huge influential circle. And so I, I take that all in, and I know everyone else is watching this will too. Um, I have to ask this question. People of color sometimes in the speaking industry can be invisible. Sometimes women are invisible, but I'd like to focus on people of color, more specifically uh, people of African descent. 
Um, we have Black NSA, and Black NSA exists to remind all folks that are Black uh, that you, you're not alone. There is a community around you. What would be, what would you like to say? We're going to have all different races watching this. Um, and so I think there needs to be two separate messages, and you can sort of package this any way you like. But one message, I think, to people not of color, to be more inclusive, to don't forget, even if, you know, there are 50 people there and not one person is a person of color, make an effort to go out and get them. And then the same message to people of color of African descent that feel as if, why aren't I represented here? Why don't I matter? Why is my voice invisible? And again, I'm not saying this specifically for um, any, any association, but just in general, with you being such an influencer in, in, for people of color, what would you like to say around that? Just a, as an encourager and just as a way to change things and shift things uh, for people of color, specifically in the professional speaking industry. Okay, so let me be honest and transparent here and speak uh, truth to power. Uh, I'm 71 years old, and my mother told me 60 years ago, Georgie boy, you're going to have to be twice as good to get half as much. Because if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave. That was true then, and it's still true unfortunately. So to my brothers and sisters, I say to you, good, is not good enough. Not for you. Not at this time. That will change someday. You have to be amazing. Amazing. Les Brown is amazing. He's been amazing for 40 years. Right? Delatoro McNeil is amazing. Simon Bailey is amazing. Lisa Nichols is amazing. And I can name you a host of brothers and sisters who have no problem being hired and getting on the big all other stages because they are amazing. And they happen to be black. And so if you are amazing and black, you will not have to look for work because America understands now that its diversity is its strength. And we are moving towards inclusion. Yes, there's, there's a generation of us that are just simply going to have to die and get over the fact that there are brown people in this country and we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> right? Yeah. And America, within the next 25 years, the largest minority in America will be white people. Black and brown and yellow and red people will be the majority. So it's, it, it's obviously going to move towards us and you, brothers and sisters. It's going to, right? But as you said, you got to be ready. And I don't mean just good, right? You got to be amazing. So let me give you a little exercise to go through, brothers and sisters, right now. I want you to do me a favor if you're, if you're watching. I want you to get a piece of paper, and I want you to write down average. Then next to the word average, I want you to write down good. And then next to the word good, I want you to write excellent. And then next to the word excellent, I want you to write amazing. So today, because the world has changed, and anybody living in a garage or an apartment can do what you do, right? Um, I remember a couple of years ago taking my, what I thought was an excellent cell phone, throwing it in the garbage, and by the way, it was an Apple, throwing it in the garbage and buying a Samsung because it was amazing, right? So anything can be replaced, right? Amazing is where you're going to have to go. So today, if you're average, if you're an average speaker, you're going to have a poor speaking career. You're going to also have poor friends and basically a poor life being average because the world has changed. So if you're average, you're going to live poor. If you're good, 
you're going to have an average life. So write average under good and write poor under average. That's why I had you write the four words, right? So if you're average, you're going to live a poor life, have a poor speaking career. If you're good, you're going to have an average life or an average speaking career. And that's if you're good. Mm -hmm. If you're excellent, you're going to have a good life and a good speaking career. And that's if you're excellent. But if you want to have an excellent life, in an excellent speaking career, you're going to have to be amazing. What does that all, all that mean? It means that today, because the world has changed, as I've said twice, you're going to live one notch below wherever you are. You see, it was different with our parents. You see, when they came through the northern migration to get the jobs in the steel mills and the, in the, in the automobile industry, all they needed to be was average and they could work in the plants and they could do repetitive work and they can do piece work and they could live, when you were average, you could live an average life. If you were good, you would live a good life. Not anymore. You're going to live one notch below wherever you are. So we have to ramp up our game. And, 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 and if you are, and we have endless examples, if you are amazing and I can point them to you, you will never have to worry about business. All right. That's, that's, that's number one. And again, to our, our European brothers and sisters, uh, the handwriting is on the wall. Um, if you want to have a well-rounded business, a well-rounded company, if you want people looking at you like you're not crazy, uh, you're going to have to have an inclusive conference, an inclusive business, and in, especially large business, and an inclusive um, uh, persona in the world of business. You're just not going to be able to thrive. You might be able to survive for some small period of time, but to thrive, you're going to have to service everyone. And right now, Minorities in America, around 30 to 35% of America's population. And within 25 years, we will be the majority. So, and I think that progressive thinking, uh, white folks understand this, and they're already doing it, and they're embracing it. And uh, they're embracing it so much that even interracial marriages <laughs> are on the rise by a lot, right? So, um, uh, so, we know, and again, just being very honest with our brothers and sisters, you will know that it's the end of racism in America when a mediocre black man could rise in the corporate world. That will never happen, right? That will never happen. Now, let me repeat that. You will know it's the end of racism in America when a mediocre black man can rise in the corporate world. It won't happen. Any brother or sister rising in the corporate world is amazing. But we are all, if you're black and living in America, have worked for mediocre white folk. We have all have done that. But that will never happen for us, right? So that will change someday because America is changing and America is becoming more loving and there we are moving towards of full equality. We're not there, but it's better than it's ever been. And maybe the worst of it, you know, you know the, good, the best of times and the worst of times, then there's some parts of, of America that's just crazy. <laughs> but uh, I have hope and I am, uh, I am uh, optimistic. Uh, I, I think the handwriting is on the wall. So as that relates to your speaking opportunities, there are unlimited speaking opportunities. Unlimited. I, I turn down 100 speaking engagements a year. Wow. Because I technically can't get to them. I physically can't get to them. So I, I you know, I, I give them to other people. I recommend other folk. I get that, those questions all the time. But why? Why? Because I'm very good at what I do. I know what I'm talking about. I can talk to all kinds of audience about my specific area of expertise. I've branded myself that way. You can't say networking in black America without thinking about me. It's just, it's just almost impossible, right? But, but I did it over a 30 year period of time. So be patient, have the discipline, be amazing, be well read, 
be a 360 degree person, be able to talk about anything and everything, okay? Um, but in your subject matter expertise, you need to be an inch wide and a mile deep. In your general knowledge, you need to be a, a mile wide and an inch deep. You get that? I got it. Right. You understand the difference? In your subject matter expertise, you need to be an inch wide but a mile deep. In your general conversational knowledge, how about being a mile wide and an inch deep? Wow, I love that. Bigger on the conversations and a little bit smaller in the niche, but still dominate. That's right. Um, that niche is. Well, Dr. George Frazier, you, you just gave us a masterclass <laughs> on dominating in the professional speaking industry and more specifically working your way up to celebrity. Your journey, what you do, what you stand for. I want to say thank you to you. Uh, just for everything you've done, how you've made a difference in this industry, how you're putting on conferences that put us to work and get our voices out there and helps the world know who we are and why they should care. And thank you specifically for being a voice for people of color. You know, I appreciate that. And we, we appreciate you as Speaker Magazine and Black NSA and just in the speaking industry overall. So I want to say a special thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. I think we had to reschedule a few times and it makes sense because you are a legend and um, I appreciate you for your time. Is there any way for anyone that's listening to say, I want to get in touch with him. Is there any way I can reach out? What, What can they do? Sure. Um, first, uh, just email me at G Fraser, F R A S E R S is in Sam G Fraser at FraserNet.com. And if there's any questions I can answer any way I can serve any way that I can help, you know, that I am there. It's very, 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 very simple. Right. And then my, my office number is uh, 216-691-6686, 216-691-6686. We've been here for 30 years. We ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I answer all my phone calls. And, uh, you know, I love connecting with people. I love serving. You know, that's the number one principle of effective networking. You give first, you share always, the getting comes later, right? Well, that goes back to what you said. Whatever you speak on, you've got to be, and that's congruency. Well, my name is Marquesa Petway. I'm a business reinvention expert out of New York. I run the National Center for Speaker Training, and I'm a proud columnist for Speaker Magazine. Thank you guys so much, and please reach out to Dr. George Frazier. You see what a powerhouse he is. Ah, I just, I'm, I'm excited for all of you, and I'll see you on that celebrity stage. Hold tight, George. <laughs>